For our last presentation today, Amar Padmanabhan is going to walk us through the development priorities we are setting for MAGMA. Amar is one of the tech leads on the MAGMA program and one of its founding engineers. Prior to working on MAGMA, Amar was an architect at Nicera Networks, an SDN startup that was later acquired by VMware. Outside his role on MAGMA, but Amar serves as a Platinum Director at the Open Infrastructure Foundation. Please join me in welcoming Amar. Thanks, Kendall. Um, I'm between me and a, uh, between everyone and a break, so I'll try to um, keep this short. So uh, are folks able to see the screen? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, so uh, mainly uh, three things that I just wanted to uh, talk about. Uh, so the first one is about how we think about roadmap in general. Um, and then the second one is what are our like sort of priority use cases? We touched upon it earlier today. I just want to tie it up on the uh, back end as well. And then the third one is to just give a sneak peek, uh, a sneak peek on into the roadmap itself. So uh, a very important thing that we wanted to uh, sort of bring to everyone's attention is how do we think about the roadmap, right? So one of the things that you know Facebook brings, um, and you know I think it's it's pretty valuable for us to try and you know influence the industry in this direction is the hacker ethos. So what is the hacker ethos? It's the belief that being open to possibilities and embracing uncertainty is necessary for the actual future to unfold in positive ways. So what does this actually mean, right? So we're very religious about building features based on concrete demand and then iterating and then figuring out where it is that the future is gonna yield. Today, we saw a lot of uh, you know, cool ideas around decentralizing like you know, um, uh, wireless networks uh, through the uh, Sylvia stock, uh, Curtis's stock, and then you know, the Helium uh, stuff as well. Now that may be an idea that you know we're very interested in exploring because it's, it it um, adds a lot of value to the market, and by not by having a fairly flexible approach to how we develop the roadmap, we react to like sort of concrete demand signals and use that to sort of prioritize our roadmap and releases. So just given that framing, um, there are three key tenets that uh, I just want to also reemphasize. So the first one is we build what is needed, right? So there, there were some questions on feature asks around NB-IoT as well as uh, you know LTEM uh, and our friends uh, on the o OEI side are actually prioritizing that into the roadmap, but the uh, focus and the ability for us to move that feature forward into a hardened um, deployment ready use case is actually dependent on partner commitment, right? Like is somebody gonna deploy this feature in the field if yes, then we're fully committed to making that successful. And then, you know, as, as an open governance, uh, you know, we're obviously always welcoming patches around that, but the priority of like testing and hardening is driven by concrete demand. The second one is around rapid iteration. Um, so more often than not, we commit to concrete sort of features uh, on a quarterly timeline, because that's what we think is a consistent um, time horizon for an early stage project that is, you know, moving through the paces and, and, you know, some use cases are obviously far more mature, like fixed wireless, but so, so some things like the 5G uh, SA stuff that we saw today are all things that, you know, we're sort of tackling in bite-sized chunks of quarterly releases. And the third one, um, as we saw in the AWS demo as well, software delivery is actually a pretty key part uh, of this. So we have prioritized some features like hitless upgrades that are gonna come as part of the stateless MME effort in 1.4, uh, lightweight uh, delivery through containers, which is a roadmap item that we're currently tracking. And then you know, one of the cornerstones that Ulash spoke about is the independence of orchestrator uh, upgrade and you know, the fault isolation of gateways. So you don't have like a large EPC that you need to upgrade and you know, take the risk of uh, that, right? So, Again, reiterating, so we build what is needed. We focus on short-term roadmaps that we commit to and quarterly releases, and then uh, heavily index on software delivery as a way to you know, keep the iteration and, uh, and the process going. The what, right? So we're currently focused on three main use cases, uh, fixed wireless access, uh, uh, Wi-Fi core, 
uh, and then private LTE. Uh, mobile broadband and 5G are more future looking use cases and 5G at this point, we're working on the, on the OC, along with the TIP OCN group on focusing um, fixed wireless as the anchor use case for pushing SA out. But um, the primary set of use cases that we're focused on at this point are fixed wireless, Wi-Fi core and private LTE. I'll just do a deep dive on uh, fixed wireless. So fixed wireless, uh, as we saw from uh, the great articulation um, by Jesse on uh, Wisconsin Connect, uh, one of the key things that we have is it's, um, it's a distributed architecture and it allows for a software uh, upgrade into 5G. Uh, the deployment model is at a cell site. Uh, so this allows us to go over links that are uh, unreliable or un unlicensed backhaul. So, you know, it's far less jitter sensitive. And then the control plane and user plane is fairly separated in the sense that there are only certain control functions that need to each out back into the orchestrator, uh, like authentication and potentially any charging and VSS semantics that you need to do. So uh, the second aspect is it's fairly, um, uh, it's, it's vendor agnostic as well as, you know, uh, transport agnostic because uh, IP gets terminated at the edge. So, you know, you can use uh, any sort of backhaul to um, translate uh, IP access uh, all the way to the edge. Uh, the third big uh, aspect of it is it's, it's a scale as you grow. So your upfront uh, CapEx investment is just in buying the small access gateway hardwares that, uh, you know, you saw in, uh, Mariel's presentation on Mural. Uh, but then as your sites grow, you can add additional capacity and your EPC capacity of your network grows along with your uh, site deployment. The third, uh, it's very third party friendly. Um, it's all REST API based. So you can integrate whatever CRM or BSS processes that are built into your operator network. And there is uh, real time monitoring, reporting and alerting that are uh, built into the system. And if it's a pre-certified e -B, you have the ability to manage those e -Bs through the orchestrator as well. So this is one of the key reasons why we think like the Magma product is sort of ideally suited for the fixed wireless solution. And that's also where we are seeing um, a lot of uh, traction. The second um, variation of this is uh, fixed wireless with MNO federation. So in this case, uh, say you're a tier one or a tier two who already has existing assets for HSS, PCRF, and OCS, then you're, you can deploy uh, Magma with the federation architecture. Uh, it has all the benefits of the, the pure play fixed wireless or the isolated fixed wireless, but it also allows you to bridge your existing uh, MNO core assets into a Magma network. Um, and then uh, there is certain, um, it, this makes it good as well for neutral host operators who are trying to uh, federate into some other networks, uh, HSS, PCRF, and OCS. The third and newer use case that we're sort of uh, trying to talk through these days, and we have a couple of early deployments on, um, at least as Facebook, is, uh, is the private LTE um, um, model, uh, the private LTE use case. Here, uh, the big selling factor is that uh, the distributed EPC enables uh, a bunch of the MEC uh, use cases. And this is what, um, you know, I think um, the AWS folks also alluded to earlier in their demo. Uh, there is also multi-APN support. So this allows you to break out uh, different traffic for different use cases, as well as you know, interconnect back into an IMS, uh, sort of a, a central IMS sort of an integration. Uh, it's natively multi-tenant, uh, so the same operator can offer uh, services to multiple enterprises, but manage it through a single OSS and a management stack. Um, and uh, within the next couple of quarters, we expect this to be fully upgradable uh, from 4G to 5G as well. So uh, the other very attractive thing um, is that uh, it's a very small form factor. So the Snow devices are four gig based um, and then the Mural devices are all are two gig devices. So these are fairly small uh, shoebox size devices that you can ship around and it's, it's fairly easy to, um, to start sort of uh, um, uh, stack. I think I have a typo on the dates. Uh, so the uh, fixed wireless should be uh, mid-March. Uh, that's what we're looking at. 
Uh, the 5G uh, is a slightly more interesting thing. Uh, with uh, 4G, it's much easier for us to understand what is an MVP because uh, you know there are concrete customers who are already deploying it or are in the process of um, you know replacing existing equipment with Magma. So it's it's very easy for us to understand what's a minimum viable feature set. So with 5G, we've actually partnered very closely with the Open Net. Uh, open core network uh, project group. Uh, so there we've defined the priority use cases and you know, um, Mansoor and Narendra had mentioned uh, uh, fixed wireless being a priority use case. So uh, through a collaboration with operators, SIs, as well as you know, engineers, we've sort of identified what is an ideal like sort of a fixed wireless 5G SA uh, requirement. Uh, that got published by uh, OpenCore um, uh, around August. And then since then we have been executing against uh, that. So Magma is effectively a reference implementation of that uh, project group. So if you're interested in driving requirements around Magma, uh, please feel free to join the uh, OpenCore network PG. We're definitely looking for more concrete use cases, especially in the fixed wireless and private 5G um, sort of verticals. So, and once the project, uh, the code lands, hopefully uh, by mid-March is when we expect an alpha quality fixed wireless. That would, again, the, the reference implementation would feed back into the open core uh, network project group and then go into lab and field trials through TIP. But obviously, since the software is available through GitHub, uh, anyone is free to uh, take this uh, source code and run with it or like, you know, create derivative works uh, around the same. So the third one, and I think this is the most interesting part is the when. Uh, this is the actual roadmap for the next couple of quarters. Um, so all of this is uh, fairly subject to uh, change. So we're on a quarterly sort of a, a, a release cadence. Uh, so release 1.4 is imminent. Uh, so we're expecting that to go out within the next week or so. Uh, so the big marquee feature in release 1.4 is uh, stateless MME. So what this is, is that the uh, all of the state in, um, it's actually stateless access gateway uh, also, including the MME, uh, all of the state in the uh, microservices in Magma is persisted in Redis. So any sort of software faults that cause the uh, services to die doesn't affect uh, existing user traffic. So all the flows and the forwarding state is cached in the kernel. So this is a great way for us to, you know, sort of improve the reliability of the system. And it's one of those uh, things that helps us move fast, right? So as soon as, um, you know, software bugs are not taking out your network, you have the ability to sort of introduce more bleeding edge features and that uh, in turn helps um, move the roadmap faster as well as you know innovate uh, in the platform. The second interesting feature uh, is uh, Cloud HA. Uh, so this is where um, you know we rely on the S1 flex feature from the eNodeB to have a cloud backup of the access gateway. So it's almost like a disaster recovery sort of a model where if your extreme edge access gateway fails, you still have an option of filling over the traffic transiently um, into a more central location. While S1 doesn't get terminated the edge, uh, this is more of a like sort of a rainy day scenario. Couple other features around header enrichment, orchestrated service mesh, and a debuggability feature called call tracing, which will allow you to understand where the packets are going. Um, and then general usability improvements that are coming as part of 1.4. The next release is 1.5, uh, which is end of uh, March. Uh, so the big feature here that I wanna uh, call out is inbound roaming. I know a couple of folks already asked for that in the call, including Muriel. Um, and I think it's also pretty clutch uh, for uh, some of the work that the Helium folks are doing as well. So it's it allows uh, uh, it allows it's basically S8, right? So it allows for um, existing ISPs to sort of sign up for roaming agreements and um, generate additional uh, revenue streams. Um, and a big theme for 1.5 is uh, around stability and usability improvements. And so you'll continue to see a bunch of like bug fixes and you know usability enhancements in the product. 1.6, which is likely end of the half, is when we're targeting um, MBIoT. Uh, this was also another feature that was requested on the chat side. And then the other big thing that we are tentatively tar targeting is the uh, inter-access gateway handover. 
Um, so this is S1 mobility across nodes. So this moves us squarely into the mobility uh, territory um, for, for 4G. Uh, the 5G fixed wireless, we hope to have it uh, beta ready by, by the end of the half. Uh, release 1.7 is pretty speculative at this point, but um, it's mostly focusing on private 5G, uh, as well as some of the uh, FWA uh, uh, 5G uh, use cases, um, along with uh, IMS integration for the 5G um, uh, use cases. But the best way for, for anyone to influence this roadmap here is to get engaged on Slack, uh, bring us concrete demand and then we're always happy to prioritize and you know understand what what features make sense what don't uh, again we're not like trying to implement every feature under the sun so getting sort of a deployment lens to the way we are we look at uh, features and functionalities of a network core is actually pretty useful and helps us align towards a tractable scope that we can execute against Uh, the second thing, apart from the technical side, is uh, we want more people to be uh, able to support Magma and take it to market. So as part of that, we're trying to uh, launch a training program by the end of Q1 uh, with uh, heavy involvement from our uh, foundation partners uh, in the Open Infra Foundation as well. So uh, this is mostly focusing um, on, on um, commercial entities like SIs or OEMs who want to take Magma to market. Um, and, and so we're developing a training program for L1 to L3 support with some sort of lab scenarios um, and then trying to figure out how we offer the exact same thing across regions because we're a fairly global community at this point. And, <clears throat> and, and I think there were some questions on TCO as well that I noticed on Slack. So uh, a lot of what is being developed for the training and certification will address some of those questions as well on like, okay, what's the business case? Why, why does Magma make sense as compared to some other core or like what's the business case for private LTE or, or, or fixed wireless? That's all I had. Um, I don't know if I have time for questions, but um, thank you everybody. And it's been a great session all day actually. Yeah, I, I would like to to offer who have been brave enough to stick with us through the whole day of, of content uh, deserve the chance. So uh, please, if you have questions, chime in. Sure, Prakash here. Uh, great presentation, uh, great conclusion number, and uh, look forward to working with you folks. And uh, essentially, it was a combination of uh, various things. So it takes some time to sink in. So maybe we should talk offline after the event sometime. Thanks. This is Vineet, the site. Can you guys hear me? Yep. OK. Uh, so, so I think uh, one question which I have is for the SI program that you guys just mentioned. Uh, how do we reach out to the the folks in you know Facebook running Magma program and get affiliated to that? Yeah, so I think uh, the way that um, so we're uh, so this is not going to be run as a as a Facebook uh, exercise. While we're definitely going to be helping uh, author the content uh, for a lot of the training material, uh, this would be something that is. Uh, done in the open through the Magma open source project. So um, so yeah, so as soon as we have the content, it should be something um, through the website, you just apply for it and you know, you, you'll be able to have access to the training. Sure, thanks Emma, much appreciated. Yeah. Um, Amar, there's a question regarding the network slicing lab testing in Q321. Yeah, so uh, Phil, I'm happy to take that if you want to take that either, either it can go either way. Go ahead, Amar. Okay, so yeah, so uh, we're um, at this point uh, trying to look for um, an anchor use case where this can uh, sort of see uh, deployment. Um, and so that will help us 
um, sort of define the the exact scenarios a little better. And so, um, so, so at this point, we think we're about like a couple of months away from actually finalizing the requirements, and then from then on, it takes a um, few months for us to actually develop that. Uh, the best way for uh, for anyone to get involved in this uh, would be to also influence the open core project group um, from our direction standpoint and give like more specific requirements to Phil or me, and then we can uh, figure out how to prioritize that. I don't know if you want to add anything, Phil. No, and I'll, I'll just say that the easiest entree for that is to bring your suggestion or question or use case uh, to the Magma uh, Slack channel in the in the general questions Slack. Uh, 